Hello, friends. Uh, welcome to Be Based Wise. And after nearly a month and a half, we have a new panel come up. And we're very glad that Adam is moderating this panel for us. Uh, this is the third panel that Adam is moderating for us. He is the Director of External Affairs at Suez Recycling and Recovery. And if you want to watch the other panels that he has moderated in the past, please go to the uh, video panel section on our website and you will be able to see them. It's available for everyone to watch. And today on the webinar, we also have Cole, who's the senior editor at Waste Dive. Cole has been part of our panels before. And the third panelist is Simon, who is a group external affairs and sustainability manager at Bifa Waste Services Limited. And as part of today's panel, we will be taking questions. Adam will be taking the questions as and when you pose them. So please feel free to share your questions. And that's it. I'm going to hand this over to Adam now. Well, thanks very much, Sweta. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, welcome, everybody, wherever you are, whichever time zone. Uh, we've got a full house, I believe. So um, we're going to crack on. 45 minutes is never enough when you've got informed people willing to share their experiences over a cup of coffee. So um, I'm, I'm, my job is simple. It's to keep the time, to keep the questions rolling and to make sure that nobody speaks for too long because we don't want to bore you. Um, we do check numbers for people that are dialing off mid-session. Mid we don't want to lose you. So um, make sure you send in your questions to us using the, uh, the chat or the Q&A function. I'm scanning those as we go. So anything that I like the look of or I think the participants won't like the look of, I'll be getting them in early and making sure we can provoke some discussion. So as Sweater said, we've got two guests and myself. We're going to share our experiences of global commodity markets and what's been happening. Um, but first and foremost, I'd like to invite Cole to introduce himself um, and give us maybe a couple of minutes on how he sees global commodities and what's his interest in this space before I hand over to Simon. So Cole, come and say hello. Good morning. Thank you, Adam. So yeah, for folks who aren't familiar with what we do at Waste Dive, we cover the business of waste recycling in the US, but that is of course becoming a, more and more of a global issue these days. And so it has become our uh, mission, especially in the last couple of years, to figure out where, where the recycling is going, uh, what it's going to mean for what uh, folks are allowed to pick up and what folks want to pick up in their residential commercial contracts and how that's going to affect um, the price structure for everything, as I'm sure you're experiencing in the UK, uh, everything's a bit upside down right now in terms of, uh, you know, there's no more rebates. That's a thing that we were used to in US contracts for a long time. There's not a lot of leeway. Things are getting very tight um, and often contentious in these negotiations, trying to renegotiate contracts midterm and all that. And so, um, you know, that lends us to track what's going on in the export world, the big one being paper, of course. Plastic gets a lot of the attention, as it's you know, certainly worth talking about. But mixed paper is by far the most uh, relevant and the most impacted aspect of what is hurting U.S. recycling programs right now. And so um, we have made it our mission to track those effects. You know, we, we bring in the international news. We also track internally. Uh, we've been doing a 50 state deep dive since November 2017 to see how this is playing out at the local level. And you can expect an update to that soon, actually, in the midst of overhauling that page. Thanks, Cole. I, I like the idea of watch this space. You're just teasing the audience that there's more to come beyond just this seminar, this webinar. So, so thank you. Um, I'm going to come back to you in a moment. I've got some great questions. I think paper is a really hot topic. I think plastics is overshadowing it, but paper is the, is the, is absolutely the right tonnage issue. Um, but I'm, I want to hand over to, to a good friend of mine, Simon. We've knocked around the block for a long time in the UK market, but today we're going to talk global, global exports and commodity markets. So Simon, introduce yourself to the, uh, to the audience and, and let me know what's been worrying you in, uh, in the last few months. Good afternoon all. And, uh, thank you for the invite to, uh, to come and talk. It's, uh, it's really great, uh, to share our experiences. So, uh, so I'm, uh, I'm the External Affairs and Sustainability Manager for BIFA. We're a, a UK waste uh, and resource management company only. So, uh, uh, so, so we, we are only based in, uh, in the UK, but uh, uh, clearly uh, no man is an island. And, uh, and uh, although the UK is uh, an island separated uh, from uh, uh, the, the rest of the continent, uh, you know, our, our global trade um, model at the moment means that we uh, we, we do uh, we, we do uh, import a lot of materials from 
throughout the, the globe and, uh, and uh, rightly so have to export uh, a lot of materials uh, uh, to elsewhere for, for processing. Uh, again, as, as I say, as a UK waste company, we're, uh, we've got about 8,000 employees, uh, 2,800 vehicles and over 190 locations. Uh, we, 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 we think we're the number one uh, leader in UK sustainability waste management. Uh, we'll, we'll leave it there. We'll leave that there. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, my focus is uh, on dealing with government, on trying to promote uh, best practice, uh, dealing with government uh, uh, throughout the UK, uh, the four devolved governments, trying to promote best practice, uh, dealing with customers as well and, and producers and trying to respond to their requirements and needs to make sure that we're collecting high quality recyclate that is suitable for uh, feeding out into the market. Uh, and probably our, our focus uh, most recently, uh, we're a big producer of refuse derived fuel. Uh, we, although we, we, we are uh, working to uh, open two waste to energy plants in the UK, we export uh, a large volume of that uh, to, uh, to, to elsewhere to, uh, uh, to Europe. Uh, and clearly, uh, you know, the, uh, the issues around that sort of export uh, uh, and the, the continuation of that and ta changes in taxation. Uh, and uh, we'll mention the Brexit word uh, and issues around, uh, uh, around exports and, and trading relationships with our nearest partners uh, uh, is, 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 is uh, really causing us some issues with our contingency planning. So uh, uh, plastics, is, as Cole suggested, plastics is a is a major uh, issue for uh, for a lot of our uh, customers and a, a lot of our members of public within the UK, uh, and we are uh, we are investing a lot in plastics recycling in the uh, in the UK to try and avoid having to uh, export some of those materials. So that probably gives you a flavour of, uh, of of where, uh, where where I come from. Thanks, Simon. Um, I won't rise to debate. Um, of course, I should introduce myself fully. Uh, Dr. Adam Reed, External Affairs Director at Suez here in the UK. Um, Suez, multinational, very large operator in, on all continents. But in the UK, we're not quite as large as Biffer. He's absolutely right. His numbers trump mine on most fronts. Although I've got a few more EFWs um, currently operational. But I think we, we suffer from the same problems that, you know, Cole and Simon have already alluded to, which is, you know, global markets are changing material specifications are changing markets are coming and going nothing seems stable and yet we've lacked the local or domestic capacity and i think this is just the same in the states in terms of building our own capacity to to treat some of these uh, these what should be um, resource uh, material streams so let's let's take us back a step um chaps let's let's talk about where where did the global why are we on a global market um and where did it all go wrong? If, if you think it's gone wrong, Simon, go on from your end. I, I don't think it's necessarily gone wrong. I think uh, we, we, we work, we, we cannot work in isolation in, uh, uh, as, a, as a little island uh, just off the uh, northwest coast of Europe. Uh, you know, I, we, we, we are interwoven in the, uh, in, in the global econom uh, economy and there's no way of getting away from that. At, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in today's uh, uh, market. Uh, my children, I, I, I have two children, they, they like to buy the latest gadgets. Very few of those gadgets are made in the UK. Uh, most of them are, are made, uh, you know, uh, by, uh, the, their current favourite one is, a, is an American company uh, with manufacturing uh, centres over in the far, far east. And, uh, you know, given that we buy most of those sort of materials that are manufactured in other, other locations, uh, we, we don't we don't manufacture all of that material ourselves. We don't have the demand for uh, for those secondary resources, uh, and that that's just a, a real fact. Uh, we were talking about some of the, the devolved administrations in, in the UK. We've got Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and England, uh, and 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 they are very keen on you know uh, really getting the infrastructure and the capacity right in those devolved locations. Uh, but the reality of it is we are in a global market. So, uh, you know, if, if China are, are uh, manufacturing a lot of materials and packaging them in cardboard uh, with paper uh, in those, they have a demand for that material. So therefore, that's why we've been sending them materials for recycling. And, and some of the recycling facilities in some of the paper and uh, cardboard mills in, in China are really 
state-of-the-art facilities that are uh, uh, probably uh, uh, you know shinier and glossier and newer than uh, some of the, the smaller ones we have in the UK. We don't have the demand for the, uh, the materials in the UK. Uh, I, just paper. I can't remember the last time I actually read uh, a, a newspaper uh, on on the go. I, you know, we all get our, not all, but we typically get a majority of our media from uh, from uh, sort of uh, online sources and from sitting in front of screens. So, you know, the demand for paper has dropped off. So, why would anyone build a, a brand new shiny paper mill in the UK where there isn't a demand for the for the product? There is the demand for, you know, office paper for for a small amount of newspaper, for uh, tissue paper, and, and and those sorts of materials, uh, but that's already sort of met from uh, from our existing markets. So we, we you know, as, as we, we might want to, uh, and we might desire that to have local control, uh, where we manufacture everything on a local basis and consume everything on a local basis and recycle or we use everything on a local basis. But I don't think that's uh, practical in, in in today's current global. Uh, Climate, and uh, we'd need a real shift in, uh, uh, in in economic models to, uh, to 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 move back to that sort of model. Thanks, Simon. I, I think you've summarised that that point really well, which is we live in a we live in one economic model, if you like, and 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 to, to change the resources space isn't something the resources sector can do in isolation of of all other commodities that are being traded. We just happen to be picking up the, you know, the, the, the discards of some of society, if you like. So we're just part of that system. Coal, the, the US, much bigger country, many more people and a lot more raw resource on your doorstep than we have in the UK. But is that, is that a similar situation? That the, the, the point that we're consuming stuff from, from other markets and therefore our local markets don't necessarily need that material. And so, Recycling has has grown to some extent because of global commodity demand from other places. Is that a fair reflection? We certainly do have plenty of land, uh, but when the economics have lined up, the paper mills have closed here in the U.S. I'm in uh, the Northeast myself. We used to have many of them. They're far fewer. Uh, all of a sudden, things are changing domestically, and I know we'll get to that later in the program. We now have uh, Chinese buyers coming in and reopening paper mills uh, in my home right. state, which is pretty interesting. Um, but yeah, there is that clearly a global trade flow. It makes sense. The containers are going over to China with uh, scrap, coming back with products. And even with um, all, everything that has happened in the last two years, our uh, paper exports are still up. They're rising, uh, largely driven by OCC, which of course has not been uh, directly affected by the uh, Chinese import restrictions, um, or not banned rather, it's you know, affected by the quality restrictions. Um, but India is a major growing market. Folks are looking at um, recognizing that they too will perhaps become more uh, resource self-sufficient in a matter of a decade or more is what I'm hearing. But for now, they're uh, somewhere that people are really watching. So yeah, on the paper side, it makes a lot of sense. On plastics, uh, we've actually seen exports drop in the last year as compared to the year prior. And so that's uh, going to, it's tricky because that one is going to be harder to solve domestically. We do have good infrastructure for say, number ones and twos. Once you get into the mix bail, it's challenging. Um, and we can talk about ideas for that later. Um, so I think, yeah, folks are still exporting a lot of paper, a lot of mill capacity coming online here though in the US, whereas plastic exports are down and no one quite knows what to do with it right now. Okay. So we're all, we're all suffering. Um, so, I mean, as, you know, Sue is, it's interesting. We've, we've been trading globally um, and we trade as a commodity block in Europe for most of our resources, secondary resources. And so to some extent we, we were protected by what was happening in China, but not, you know, but no means were we not, not rippled by it, if you like. And, and I think we've, we've quickly got into and have been for, I don't know, the last 18 months been looking at other markets, um, the due diligence of those markets, the visiting the plants, the looking at investment. And we, we've actually, you've talked about Chinese investment in your paper mills. We've actually started to invest in new mills in Malaysia and Indonesia, for example, to build that, 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 that global capacity, but, but a, a scale and a, uh, an operating protocol that we feel comfortable with because I think one of the things we get challenged about uh, in the trade press here in the UK and around Europe is you're exporting the low-grade stuff 
and you hope the market will cope with it. And, and if they don't, well, maybe it'll never come back. And, you know, we're the big bad wolf in all of this. And, and the reality is we thought we were meeting a, a specification for a market or a paper mill or a mixed plastic mill or whatever it might be. And then suddenly that changes overnight or the policy of the country changes or the, or the way that they operate their export um, assessments at the, at the ports. And, and so suddenly something that was a target material is no longer a target material. I think, I think we're living in very rapidly turbulent times here where we think we're, we're okay. So I think what's interesting for me is that you've alluded to new markets and new ownership and new investment. But question for both of you, and we'll start with you, Cole, because I can see you at the moment. How, how confident are you about that kind of model of new investment, whether it's inward investment into our countries or our, our investment into other countries? How do we do the due diligence? How do we know that those plants are going to operate well when they're thousands of miles away and, and the rules and regulations of the countries in question uh, are beyond our control? Because that's the problem again. We're, we're not the regulator. We're not the government. We might want to put money in. We might want to close the loop. We might want to do the right thing environmentally. But it's still an economics and political game. And, and, and both of those are sometimes beyond the scope of a, a large waste management company or even a, a global resource company. So how, how do you see that working? Yeah, that's the big question now. I would say, you know, to your point, you can uh, send representatives of the company over to tour facilities, work with your trade associations. Uh, there's stuff one can do, but even still, you don't fully know, uh, right? What the political situation is going to be, what the... Um, labor and environmental factors may be on the ground once you leave after the tour is done, what does it actually look like day to day? And so I think that has given, in the U.S. anyway, some of the largest recyclers pause on exporting. Let's be honest, if they could still do it, if the markets were there, I'm sure they'd gladly do it. But that political and social factor is part of it. Uh, it actually came up at one of our largest uh, waste conferences of the year, earlier this year in Las Vegas. There's an audience question to the CFOs of all the big companies, when will you stop exporting plastic? Uh, full stop exporting any plastic and they said oh we are, we've already stopped we are not exporting plastic anymore it was like a point of pride slash a, a sensitivity for them still exporting plenty of paper in OCC and I think there's still of course some U.S. companies exporting plastic let's not pretend um, but the largest of the bunch claim they are not and so for that very reason um, and so I think there's more of a sense that you can control those factors domestically you know who you're dealing with, um, perhaps you, they will invest in it or they can go tour it. You know, there's um, among the many projects coming. Uh, a couple of years. Domestic more so than international, at least in the near term for us. Uh, Cole, you just mentioned you had a big waste management event in Las Vegas. I, I love the irony of that. Yeah, right in the desert. Uh, yeah, not, not too much sustainable about Las Vegas, I'll tell you that. Uh, <laughs> but that's where it is just about every year. Uh, Simon, let's bring you in. Um, how, how, I mean, you know, Biff is making quite a bit of investment in the UK market at the moment. But, you know, have you thought about investing overseas or are you looking at inward investment from from overseas into the UK like we've seen with um, we've seen it with the Chinese into some of our paper mills? So how, how do you see that working? And is that something we should embrace or should we be worried? I don't think we should uh, be worried about these sorts of uh, competitions and, uh, uh, and, and as a business yes we have in the past looked uh, at uh, overseas markets uh, and uh, you know uh, 15 20 years ago we had a division in, uh, in Belgium uh, and, uh, and, and operations in, uh, in, in the Republic of Ireland uh, but at the moment it's uh, we, we've focused on the UK market because that's that's where our level of expertise is, and we're 100% we're comfortable with that. Uh, we, we will try, and we have been uh, attempting to, uh, to onshore as much of our treatment capacity as, as possible. Uh, I think, as Cole suggested, uh, paper and, uh, uh, and card are, are particular issues. Uh, plastics, uh, we, we've recently just invested £37 million uh, uh, pounds in a... Uh, and, and the construction of a new PET recycling plant in uh, in Siam, uh, which will uh, which will uh, r massively expand our capability there, and uh, and 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 all of the material that will be going through that uh, plant will be sourced in the UK, and all of the material, all, all of the outputs from that plant, uh, we have market we have UK markets for it. 
Uh, so for certain materials, and uh, again, as Cole said, there are, there are easier to, to recycle materials that, uh, uh, that should be promoted. So working with government to then uh, look at, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, things like regulatory frameworks around materials. Uh, we can only deal, you know, we, we should stop looking at the end of the pipe, looking at what's coming down uh, and, and think more circular. Uh, so, you know, really pushing governments to, uh, to challenge uh, producers and uh, people who are designing materials uh, to ensure that uh, where we where we, where we are putting materials on the market, novel materials, uh, we're not just doing it because some designer thinks it looks shiny and nice. Uh, you know, we are actually doing it for a, for a very good reason. Uh, and the recyclability of those materials should be high on that, uh, that agenda. So again, UK policy, uh, we're looking at uh, taxing, uh, the, the UK government are looking at taxing. Um, materials which don't have a certain amount of recycled content. We don't know what the level will be and we don't know what the taxation will be. You know, there's been talk of uh, a minimum of 30% recycled content. Uh, so then that recycled content has to come from somewhere. That then puts a pull factor on the industry to actually produce that tonnage. And whereas previously we've been uh, struggling to compete against virgin polymer uh, when the price of oil has been particularly low, uh, you know, that, uh, and the volatility of the oil price has been uh, all over the place. That really then adds another dimension, uh, that pull factor uh, adds another dimension into uh, giving a settled uh, financial environment for investment in UK, uh, uh, in UK sort of processes and producers. So again... I'm going to interrupt because I'm the chairman, Simon. So Absolutely. Be, be quiet. Um, I want to follow up on that point before you, before you finish. I, I think as somebody who spends just as much time as you do working with UK government, um, and I think our, our portfolio of policy initiatives at the moment is incredible. Uh, for those of you around the world, I'm just going to name some. At the moment, we've got people, uh, Barcelona, Jordan, Philadelphia, several other European countries, and a few places in Eastern Asia that I can't even pronounce. I mean, this is fantastic turnout, people. Thank you. Keep getting those questions in. But what's interesting for people looking into the UK is there's so much policy happening at the moment um, and we're kind of all hoping that we can just get one or two of these policies to land and everything starts to roll in terms of the momentum around the system but if you look at almost all of our policies they're all about trying to change the system and even the the, the you know extended producer responsibility or deposit returns it's all about quality of the materials but when you look at your 30 percent tax the, the thing that worries me about anything like that is you're trying to change the economics of a virgin material to a recycled content material. And I think that's a great, that's, that's a great ap approach to have. And I, I would recommend any country around the world trying to do something similar because I think it does change the game, but it's still, you're, you're, you're fighting global economics again. And it's kind of how can you guarantee that in any year your incentive is big enough to deal with fluctuations in global commodity prices for virgin, for example. So we all know how diesel and petrol prices go up and down depending on what's happening in the Middle East. Um, and I'm sure it's the same in the, in the US coal. But I do worry that if you're trying to leverage more recycled content, then how you've got to set those two, those two pricing mechanisms against one another so that one tracks the other. So it's always cheaper to use recycled content or always more expensive. Um, and I think that's really, that's quite a difficult thing to do. But the other thing, and just my final point before I open it to you two again is I worry that saying we need 30% recycled content, otherwise you're going to get a fine or, a, or, or some kind of levy is all well and good. But where do you get the 30% recycled content? There's nothing in there that's saying we want to grow domestic reprocessing capacity. What, what government at the moment is saying, and I worry that the European Union are, are going down the same, same track here, is they're not being explicit about our market or it kept secondary resources from within you know, whatever our defined boundaries may or may not be in the future. But it's just open to the global market again. So wherever you can get secondary recyclate from, you'll get it at the, at the, at the lowest price that meets your specification demand, whether you're Coca-Cola or Procter & Gamble or any other big, big producer. And, and I do worry that that will just mean there'll be this competing feedstock going around the world that maybe doesn't mean our recycled content gets recycled locally. It might go around the world twice before we might get it back or might not. I, I, I think we're tinkering with global ec 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 economics and, and trade patterns, but 
the UK is not big enough to tinker. Um, sorry if I upset any Brits on the call, but we're just not. Um, and I'm not sure the, the US is either anymore, but, you know, we'll open that one up. So uh, finish off, Simon, you, you, you were midstream, but, you know, you, there are a few no, no. of my ramblings. No, no, I, 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 I do take on board what you say, and it is uh, potentially, uh, you know, and, and I, I fully appreciate we're a small island off the uh, uh, northwest coast of uh, Europe, you know, uh, and uh, as a global player, it's, uh, you know, we have a small uh, part to play, but, uh, uh, you know, as, as I don't think we can, uh, we, we can, I really think we've got to put in place policies which does drive forward uh, to the benefit of the environment. And the reality of where we get that recycled content from, uh, you know, we, we are currently part of the European uh, community. And, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll mention no more about that. <laughs> but I mean, whether, whether we get the recycled content from uh, a plant in, uh, in, in Germany or, uh, or, or, or Belgium or the Netherlands is, is of little consequence. If, if we're driving forward the use of that recycled material as opposed to the use of virgin material, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a positive from an from a environmental perspective. Uh, interestingly, I was talking to recently to a, uh, a global uh, 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 cleaning products supplier uh, who was talking about uh, just the publicity behind this and and how a lot of their changes of behaviour have been because, uh, you know, there has been an absolute drive from members of the public to, uh, to start tackling these real global issues around pollution, plastics in the ocean, uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, climate change. And, and I am not one of these people that, uh, that, that suggest plastic are a bad thing at all. Uh, they are absolutely fantastic if they're utilised properly, uh, utilised where necessary, uh, and reused uh, and recycled. Uh, they're, they're, that's the real answers uh, to them, or, or, or minimise or reuse and recycle. But I mean, he was he was saying that uh, you know they'd moved one product to 100% recycled content, and had absolutely no uh, sort of uh, publicity about it, or no fee. Not they had some, but not you know people weren't actually really uh, going overboard until they managed to secure. 10% of that uh, recycled content uh, from ocean plastics. And at that particular point in time, everyone was uh, going overboard about the, you know, this 10% from recycled content <laughs> from ocean plastic and completely ignoring all the real hard work they'd done to get the 90%. You know, we've, we've all got a ride on that sort of, uh, uh, that enthusiasm for, for people to, uh, to, to reduce the amount of resources they consume and, uh, and manage them properly. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I'm, I think there is a positive by pull, putting those pull mechanisms and uh, uh, yes, where, whether it comes from the UK uh, or, uh, or, or further, uh, uh, further afield, uh, I would hope that that just gives you a little bit more uh, uh, economic certainty to, to develop UK uh, infrastructure, which is where, where we're looking to do. Uh, and uh, yeah. Sounds like, sounds like a plan, mate. I mean, I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think operating at the right scale, you know, does give you flexibility and robustness in your system. UK PLC operating in isolation may, may, may struggle. So, so Cole, the US, loads of muscle. You're going to flex them. What, what, how, how do you see this, the markets changing? What's, ca can you influence them sufficiently, given that you're still buying global commodities and materials? Um, yes and no, I would say it depends on the, uh, the type of content. If you ask, uh, you know, advocacy groups and legislators, they think they, they can influence the markets enough with, uh, pushing bills through that say you have to do this to your point about recycled content. Um, for any global listeners who may not have seen California just passed what many think is probably the most aggressive, uh, rec recycled content mandate in the world, uh, for plastic beverage containers that are part of the, uh, container deposit system. They're going to have to hit 50% uh, recycled content by 2030. Um, and with some benchmarks phased in over time, where will that come from? How will that work? A lot of good questions there. Um, and that, that is notable. And even that was overshadowed by what almost passed, which was a, a very large, very sweeping uh, EPR bill, essentially, that would have mandated 75% uh, waste reduction for, from single-use products by 2030 in terms of manufacturers who have to figure out how to make sure their stuff is getting recycled um, and also influence design factors by making everything uh, quote recyclable and compostable by 2030. Uh, it came very close to getting wow. passed um, 
uh, the California legislative session ended on Friday, quirk of the calendar. I have a feeling it will at least get very close next year, if not pass. And all of a sudden, that forces folks along. One of the critiques that came up in that process was, how can you pass this without parallel uh, infrastructure conversation? You know, yep. be it a funding bill, be it a market development thing. You know, there's a lot of folks that said, okay, we like the idea, but where is it going to come from? How's it going to work? And so I would anticipate that's going to come up more. Um, what we are seeing, we, we have not seen any kind of sweeping infrastructure bill out of our uh, U.S. Congress or any kind of big money coming in. Uh, there's grants here and there at the state level, but there is an interest in more engagement than there was in the past, both from our federal EPA down to state agencies and beyond. Folks want to get together and have more official conversations about how to develop markets in the U.S. And uh, so I think as that happens, as folks start to see there are maybe connections to be made they didn't realize, um, some of this stuff starts to feel a little more realistic. That, that's really interesting because that's very parallel to what the UK has been discussing for the last 12 months, which is lots of policy initiatives to try to tr change the economic model or to change the requirements for recycled content or to force EPR and DRS. Uh, and actually now that all the discussion is and how do we finance, how do we, how do we get the infrastructure? Who's planning for that? Because it's all well and good who having legislative change over the next two or three years. But if you haven't got the infrastructure already in train, then you could have two or three years of hiatus where the policies in place and we're all told to do differently. And then suddenly, you know, we're still waiting for the facilities to open. So then you're still hijacked by, by the commodity markets that we're trying to, you know, trying to address. So that's really interesting that we've got some real parallels going on. Look, I, we've talked a little bit about plastic. We talked a little bit about paper. Um, I've got a question here about what, how, what's the pricing like in the U S at the moment? I mean, what's the trends been on cardboard, uh, quality paper, PET, HDP. Have you got some general trends you want to share, Carl? What's, what's, what's the market looking like? Sure. Um, I'll be frank. I don't track this as closely as I ought to. Um, I, we, we have waste over kind of generalists. We cover, you know, the landfills, the incinerators, recycling organics. Um, I would refer folks to uh, resource recycling is uh, one of our, uh, competitors, so to speak, but they do excellent work, much deeper dive in plastics news also. Um, but generally speaking, OCC has been down this year. It's really been uh, hurting folks on the back of everything else that's happening. OCC was semi-reliable for a time, and that has lately not been the case. Um, for certain types of plastics, uh, there's domestic markets for number ones and twos, as I've said, and that those have been fairly sta stable, not to say they haven't been affected. Um, but anything in the three through seven bail is a challenge. Folks are having some luck pulling out the number fives and, you know, making a specific bail out of that if the infrastructure's there. Um, but yeah, on the plastic side, things are pretty tight. There's ways to send it. I always hear from folks who say, no, I'll, I, I can buy it. There's a market for it. Please don't say it. there's nothing there. Might have to ship it a little farther, for, you know, perhaps to Canada, um, but markets are there. Um, I think the conversation on plastics is shifting to pivot a little bit. Um, maybe we're not going to keep looking for the same types of markets. All of a sudden, this concept of uh, quote unquote chemical recycling is getting a lot yep. of talk here in the US. And so all of a sudden that might change the market dynamics for what things are worth and who wants them. Uh, there's a very big push by the plastics industry for chemical recycling here right now. I'm going to hold that thought because I want to come back to that before we finish. But um, there's a question here and I, I, don't, I don't think it's pertinent to our discussion because I don't think it's a global commodity. Food is a global commodity, but I don't think food waste is. I mean, Simon, you're not, you're not exporting any food waste anywhere, are you? No, we, uh, we, we because of the, the, uh, the nature of the material and uh, the controls on anything that contains meat uh, material, uh, the, the, the controls on that are so tight uh, that the material doesn't travel very far at all. Uh, and we, we, we all, I'm, I'm almost sure as a UK PLC, we have domestic capacity to deal with all of the food waste uh, we produce, be that uh, anaerobic digestion. Uh, and we, like yourselves, operate anaerobic digesters uh, where uh, you know, they're, they're, they're very good at recovering energy from that food waste, reducing uh, the, uh, you know, the emissions and producing a, a fantastic uh, uh, fertilizer material out the back end that, uh, you know, goes back into agriculture, uh, which allows people to grow more food. Uh, you know, one of those circular, uh, circularity, um, uh, virtuous circles that we really, really uh, are, are aiming to. So, so we're, 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 we've you know, pretty much achieved that on a UK scale. Uh, and the same with, uh, you know, a small amount of uh, food waste will go to uh, uh, composting, in-vessel composting. Uh, and again, uh, because, of the, because of the weight, because of the volume, because of the nature of the material, it's certainly not traded on a, on a global uh, uh, scale. 
No, as you say, we're exactly the same. And actually, we don't move that material very far at all because it's wet and it degrades quickly. So the last thing you want is it hanging around anywhere. So, um, you know, it's it's something that has to be treated in a, what I would call much more local closed loop. Um, but why wouldn't you put it back to agriculture or to, to land reclamation? And um, if government policy in the UK and, and, and in Europe um, goes through as expected, then household collections of food waste um, are going to become the norm. Um, and, and that's going to just increase that tonnage of material that's available. So I would expect to see a lot more of these anaerobic digesters or in-vessel composters popping up across the UK. Um, and that could be good for, for that circular loop in terms of uh, soil quality, agricultural, and, and us actually growing some, some produce locally that we, that we might consume rather than strawberries all year round, which I'm definitely not being grown in the UK. No, but uh, you know the markets are there for soft roots. So Scotland, uh, Scotland, uh, uh, you know, part of the UK has a uh, uh, you know a, a mandatory separate food waste collection requirement, uh, and uh, you know the, the the market in Scotland is far uh, you know far better, far greater uh, uh, volumes are collected, uh, both from householders and uh, industrial commercial uh, uh, locations. Uh, there are. Uh, anaerobic digesters in Scotland that are producing a quality output that goes back to agriculture and in Scotland. Uh, the raspberry is king, I believe. So, uh, uh, yeah, Scottish. Who'd have thought? Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're a little bit past the season, but uh, yeah. Uh, but again, getting those soft roots and, and getting the, the, those materials, uh, you know, grown on on, on uh, soils improved with, uh, uh, you know, uh, digestate or, uh, or or the ammonia rich. Because they come out of those uh, anaerobic digestion plants is absolutely fantastic. So, so your your comment on AD, we've had Cole's comment on chemical recycling. We've got about ten minutes left, and I want to bring those two together in a in a, in a bit of a discussion. And we've had a couple of new questions come in, so I'm gonna gonna get some soundbite solutions in a moment. We are in the UK. We, we've been talking about sector deal, and a sector deal is kind of a an offering to government that you know the sector waste and resources will will go that bit further and deliver faster and higher targets if you just give us a hand. It might be cash. Uh, uh, it might be loosening policy, it might be improving standards, it might be campaigning with the public to get them to do the right thing. And I think what's interesting is we've been looking at this sector in the UK as a, as a facilitatory sector going forward, one that fuels green growth in chemicals, fuels green growth in aviation, um, fuels green growth in, in agriculture, because we're providing the raw materials um, to those industries in a, in a form that suits them, but gives second and tertiary life. So I've got a question for Cole on this one. How do you see this kind of evolution of the sector potentially into something that's not just about keeping streets clean and getting rid of rubbish so we don't have health and, and vermin issues and turning it into a productive facilitatory sector that doesn't matter if it's trading globally or locally is, is really closely aligned to those new those new sectors that want to be greener who historically have been fossil fuel, you know, orientated. What do you reckon, Cole? Chemical recycling? We, has it got some, has it got some legs? Um, well, if you talk to the boosters, they sure say it does. There's uh, so there have been you know, facilities opening some uh, local governments are even starting to award contracts uh, for pilots. And so it's, it's moving on chemical recycling and uh, you know, we'll see if it reaches the full uh, potential that some see. Um, but yeah, in terms of how we can see the U S waste sector, take on a, a new direction, a more you know, circular economy approach. A lot of that is driven by our local governments here. You know, uh, there's kind of a split system where sometimes local governments handle all the collection and processing themselves. Sometimes they contract out pieces of it. But uh, the majority of our uh, waste recycling sector is now run by private companies, many of uh, basically a handful of publicly traded companies. Um, they have a wide range of uh, offerings they make the most money on collection and then there's you know disposals right up there recycling even when it was good was at best maybe 10 percent of their revenue our organics are not even enough to show up on the balance sheet literally for most of these companies right now uh and so seeing them shift it's going to be uh, a slower evolution i've asked many of the executives about this when i interview them you know could they shift business models what would that look like you never rule anything out uh but they are not uh as diversified i would say as um some folks in the uk right now it's still more of a a bit of an old-fashioned model um so okay. again could they do it i'm sure they could but we don't uh, for example we don't have any um recycling only companies left in the u.s there are no just right. large private recyclers they've all been bought or gone out of business so 
it's a different landscape here. That's 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 interesting. So your your market is is actually sort of determining what may or may not come to the fore. That's quite that's quite interesting. So Simon, what's um what's Biffa's appetite with chemical recycling? Or shouldn't I ask? Um, I, I'll tell you what Suez is in a moment. So don't worry. But um, how do you see that maybe playing out in the UK? And 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 are, are there other novel circular economy solutions that may change the global dynamic around some of these material streams? Yeah, I mean, uh, we, uh, we, we're always looking for efficient, low carbon ways of uh, recycling materials and, and turning materials back into useful uh, items. For some of the uh, easier to recycle plastics like HDP and PET, uh, we're not sure necessarily whether the economics uh, stack up for, uh, uh, for these chemical recycling uh, processes, uh, but for other materials, uh, for some of the more uh, problematic Materials. I think Cole mentioned mixed uh, uh, plastics and, and some of the lower grade plastics. Uh, I think there's there's there's, there's possibly a uh, uh, a role to play. And uh, yeah, uh, like yourselves, I'm sure we're uh, we're all in discussion with a variety of academics and uh, academic institutions. Uh, you know, very bright minds uh, there uh, to uh, to look at what uh, what's coming over the the horizon with regard to uh, potential technologies that we can. Uh, we can harvest and uh, and uh, you know commercialize. Uh, so yes, uh, as with most things, putting all your eggs in one basket is is probably not a sensible thing. And having a diversified treatment process. But you know, if you've got uh, high quality uh, uh, HDPE or PET uh, that can be physically uh, turned into uh, to uh, you know a reusable pellet, food grade or otherwise, uh, then you know that makes sense. Uh, but for the more challenging materials, chemically taking them back to monomers and, uh, and recombining them, putting them out there to the market for uh, for recombination makes uh, makes some sense. Yeah, I mean we we support the drive around chemical recycling. I mean we we had our own plant for those that don't know um, for a little while in in the UK and the global commodity price around diesel was what really kind of brought our technically deliverable plant to a, to an early end was it just couldn't compete in terms of what we could produce and, 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 and put on the market. But we now know government in the UK have been very open about their support conceptually for, for chemical recycling. And in Europe, there's some very strong lobby groups now, now positioning chemical recycling higher than mechanical recycling because it's it, it, the quality in theory of the, of the monomer it, it enables you to do so many other things than simply go bottle to bottle. So I think this is a space we need to watch because it could have a drastic impact on how we move, you know, lower grade plastics and films and, and mixed grade plastics in the future. So really interesting. I'm, I'm conscious of time. I've got a couple of quick questions here. So one is, um, and Simon's already been having some banter about this, but any good references, for um, commodity price tracking. So Simon's already alluded to one, which is the let's recycle.com website, which is a great site that we use. You've got the MRW materials recycling world uh, site in the UK as well, which does a similar tracking. And you've also got RAP in the UK who do tracking of commodity ma markets. But what about globally? Well, um, are there other so sources in the US? We've heard about uh, recycling um, journals and that. Carl, what do you, where, where do you go for your data? Sure. Um, so uh, recyclingmarkets.net is a popular one here in the U.S. Uh, and then the trade associations are great resources. Um, ISRI, Institute of Scrap Recycling Industries, and then RISI, R-I-S-I, um, which tracks all things fiber. And then on the plastic side, there's a variety of, um, you know, trade groups I go to. But that's that's my route, to be frank, as a journalist, I ask for information for free. <laughs> I, I, usually I'm the one being asked for the information for free. I, honestly, I, I wish I was free. Um, I'm conscious of time. I'm, I'm happy to take one or two more questions. We've had a question about getting more information about some of the policy changes in the UK. Um, my, my reference source would be just look up DEFRA, which is the Department for Environment in the UK. Look up their website. There's so much policy, so many recent consultations. It took me months to read it all and, and, and most of it will bore you, but there's some really interesting nuggets, but the same on the commission. You know, the European Commission's got a lot of work out there on the circular economy and how that might get implemented in the nation state. So there's, there's really good reading material out there, which is helping change the context for our discussion on global commodities. So chaps, one minute each. What's your one or two key points that we need to be wary of 
or interested in going forward over the next year or 18 months around commodity markets and pricing? What, what, what do we need to watch out for? Carl, you're up first. Sure. Um, it will be very telling to see what happens with our domestic uh, mill expansion going on here in the U.S. You know, does that fill the gap? How does that affect pricing? Uh, and there's more to come. Uh, what happens in terms of uh, Chinese either uh, owners or investors in uh, paper mills and other plastics facilities? Interesting trend. And then the other one I'd raise, it's, we didn't really talk about it today, it's probably a whole other webinar, um, the issue of measurement. Very dry, very wonky stuff, but it's coming up a lot. Um, are we going to measure success through a sustainable materials management approach that you know looks at life cycle analysis, emissions reductions, et cetera, or is it still going to be weight based? Because if it's still weight based, a lot of folks think that's just not really working anymore, um, and that makes uh, challenges for some of these uh, you know targets for X diversion rate, this, that, the other. Um, there, that's kind of a, a battle would be too strong of a word, a, a debate going on here in the U.S. is how how we're going to track success on this. Well, I hope Sweat is listening in intently because I, I think there's at least another webinar or two in that. I, we've been doing a lot of work in the UK looking at alternatives to, to weight-based. We've talked carbon, we've talked life cycles, we've talked natural capital, um, we've talked social value. I mean, the list is almost endless now of how you might want to change the metrics that underpin policy and therefore underpin decision-making, uh, whether it be finance or or infrastructure based. So that's really interesting. Thank you, Carl. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Uh, Simon, you've almost got the last word. What, what do you think we should be watching out for? What's, what's going to be hot? Well, I think, uh, you know, continual vigilance of if you are utilizing overseas markets, uh, making sure that those materials are really being recycled, uh, you know, and the environmental standards at those end uh, markets are, uh, are comparable to those within your domestic market. Uh, we, 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 as I said, suggested earlier, are looking to uh, onshore as much as possible or, or certainly work with suppliers in the uh, EU uh, and local markets uh, uh, for, 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 for lots of materials and, uh, and, and, and really drive forward to uh, increasing investment in uh, domestic infrastructure uh, to, to, to get that uh, closed loop uh, sort of recycling systems at a very local level. Uh, I think that uh, that that then gives uh, you know you you can show that to members of the public. You can actually take them around it. They can touch it and feel it, and uh, really get enthused because there's nothing worse than uh, uh, you know some of the the horror stories we see that then put off and disincentivize people from doing the right thing and collecting recycling and putting it uh, separately into their recycling bins if they think it's not being dealt with properly. Uh, so I think uh, you know making sure that. Uh, uh, those traceability systems uh, are there, but also, as, as Cole suggested, you know the, the, the alternative metrics are, uh, uh, as, as you said, we've been talking about for a little while. We, we probably need to bottom that out in the next 18, uh, 12, 18 months. That's fantastic. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Cole. Uh, brilliant insights, uh, honesty, uh, and entertaining as well, uh, which has been great. Hopefully, the uh, the audience have enjoyed themselves. I, I just want to wrap on this. I, I think. Metrics is fascinating. I think, you know, there's a webinar in that sweater. We'll, we'll, we'll sort that one out. Um, I think vertical alignment's a really interesting one. And, I, you know, you've alluded to that, Simon, with, with some of your working with partners. But Suez have, have globally uh, joint ventured with Leon Del Bosso, one of the biggest uh, plastics manufacturers. We'll give them the feedstock quality that they demand to create recycled content of, of a certain level. And I think that's a really interesting. Are we going to start seeing the waste and resources sector playing in different ways with that vertical chain. I think that's something you need to watch out for, boys and girls, because I think that you can start to see some really interesting global partnerships coming, which will, will make global commodity trading fine because we'll control all of the parts of the equation and we won't be reliant on bits of, of far-flung East Asia with plants that we're not certain about and how they're operating. I think, you know, the last thing I need is my mum and my gran phoning me up telling me I saw that documentary last night. Why are my, why are my plastic bottles ending up on a beach in, in, in Jakarta or somewhere similar? We, we just can't. Now, that's, that's taking us backwards. So I think the future has to be about global commodities, but it's about quality. It's going to be about supply chains. It's going to be about metrics. It's going to be about uh, transparency. Um, and I think that's all very positive. So hopefully you've enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to hand us back to Sweater now. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you for joining. Thank you for asking me some tough questions. I hope we've done a good job. And it's been my privilege to host this webinar. See you at the next one. Thank you. Sweater, it's yours. Thank you, Adam. It seems like we have a topic for the next webinar already.
So, so the rest of you, you will get to know when Adam's next panel is going to come up. We will put it up on our website. And before we close, uh, we're going to have another panel next week. And the details of which will be up on our website uh, by tomorrow. So please do come to the events page on our website and sign up for that one as well. And that's it for now. So bye to everyone. Thank, thank you, Cole, and thank you, Simon, as well. Bye-bye. Thank you.